Hi, my name is Christine Abregana, and I am the host of Lagim, a Filipino true crime podcast. Every other Friday, I publish episodes about true crime cases, both from the Philippines and the Filipino diaspora. However, there are just some cases out there that are too obscure. There's not a lot of information about them, or they are still ongoing. So I cannot feature them in my podcast just yet or ever. So I've chosen this platform and this format to tell you all about those cases. Today, we are going to be talking about the very recent Ateneo de Manila shooting. And I think the best way to go on about this is to just start from day one, 24th of July. So we'll start with the 24th of July. On the 24th of July, news broke out that a shooting had taken place just before a graduation program was about to start at the Ateneo de Manila University campus. It was the university's law school that was holding the program or was going to hold one. Amongst the more prominent guests who were invited was Supreme Court Chief Justice Alexander Gismundo, who was still luckily on his way to the university when the shooting took place. The program was going to be held at the Arete building, which was not too far away from one of the university's main entrance gates. First, reports indicated that three people had died as a result of the shooting, and at least one person was injured. The three casualties were later identified as former Lamitan City Mayor Rose Forigay and her longtime aide Victor George Capistrano, along with an Ateneo security guard named Genevan Bandiala. It was Forigay's daughter Hannah who was wounded and later rushed to the hospital. Police would later announce that they had apprehended the shooter, and he was identified as 38-year-old Dr. Chao Tiao Yumol. Reports would later state that Yumol gained access to the university premises by using a ride-hailing app without raising any red flags, something that Ateneo later sought to discuss with the police because moving forward, such ride-hailing apps would now pose a serious security concern. As for Yumal, after gaining access to the premises, he then blended in with the rest of the crowd waiting for the graduation program to start. As Yumal spotted Rose Forigai, he fired at her at close range. This is said to have transpired around 2.55 p.m. Rose Forigai fell to the floor whilst more shots rang out, hitting Hannah Forigai, who was still in her graduation toga. Both Rose Forigai and Genevan Bandiala were taken to two separate hospitals but were declared dead upon arrival. Victor George Capistrano was declared dead on the scene. The whole campus was then placed on lockdown much later at around 5.30 in the afternoon. Yumol was then seen fleeing the scene by commandeering a car from inside the campus, but this is something that is still being debated. Some reports then stated that Yu Mol, after managing to leave the Ateneo premises, went into the residential areas near Katipunan Avenue. He was subsequently arrested along Aurora Boulevard after a short police chase. Now, how this all transpired was actually caught on some CCTV. In some reports, CCTV footage was released, and this showed how Yu Mall was heading towards a tricycle terminal along B. Gonzalez Street. He got onto one of the tricycles, but then changed his mind and got out again. He was then seen trying to get the keys to one of the tricycles from its driver, who refused to give them to Yumol. He was then seen running on Esteban Abada Street after barangay authorities gave chase. Another set of CCTV footage showed how Yumol was inside a car. He made a beeline for Xavierville Avenue before exiting into Katipunan Avenue towards Aurora Boulevard. GMA News then showed footage of authorities in front of St. Joseph Shrine on Aurora Boulevard trying to flag down a bus previously boarded by Yumol. He stopped it, alighted, and was then arrested. He was subsequently brought to Camp Caringal. Two guns were then confiscated from Yumol's possession, one of which had a silencer. News about the shooting had slowly seeped through the usual networks like Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. As the day progressed, one could see trends forming in those social media networks. Some were completely horrified with what happened, and some not so much. 
One tweet that caused a lot of outcry was from a reporter from PTN or the People's Television Network, and it is now deleted, but it said, Nagbarila na yata ang mga pinklawan at dilawan. Now, I will not get into the specifics of this tweet or the political side of it or the divisiveness of this tweet because that's not the purpose of this video. However, we do learn that the tweet, as I said, was deleted. It was then submitted for investigation, but it's not clear really what the results were of this investigation. Later that day, Ateneo had announced that at this point, the graduation ceremonies for the university's law school had been canceled, and they also released a statement condemning the shooting as expected. As the afternoon progressed, messages from politicians, including the new president and the new VP, started coming in, and they all condemned the shooting. Most importantly, the public was gradually getting a clearer picture of the suspect and a possible motive for the shooting. Now, both Yumol and Furigai are or were from Lamitan. As it happened, Yumol had, up until a few days after the shooting, a huge following on Facebook where he was blue check verified. His supporters, like himself, are loyal pro Duterte supporters, presumably pro Marco supporters as well. He supported the former president's brand of vigilante justice. Most, if not all, of his 73,000 plus followers agreed with his views on this and other issues as well. He was closely associated with other pro Duterte vloggers and content creators like Maharlika, someone who has been fact checked in the past and deemed as prone to posting inaccurate information. Maharlika herself posted on this day after Yumol was arrested and the doctor was said to have been merely pushed to kill after suffering at the hands of the Furigais, according to Maharlika. This was a narrative that quickly became front and center on pro Duterte and pro Marcos pages and social media accounts. Apart from showing his support for the former president on social media, Yumol's usual content consisted of criticizing those who criticized or still criticize Duterte. A common target was former VP Lenny Robredo. Now, Rappler did a rather good visualization of the clustering of UMOL's posts based on a natural language by analyzing 2,000 posts he had made from November 2017 to July 2022. Now, there's a lot that you can see and glean from this visualization, but my three biggest takeaways are that 13% of the posts were about expressing support for or were in defense of President Duterte. 4% of the posts were about Furi guys or the Furi guys as a family. 1.6% of the posts were about the former mayor alone. But apart from all that, Yumal had a huge bone to pick with Rose Furi guy, and it would seem her whole family, which kind of leads us to the discussion of possible motives. Now, it looked like there had been and there are still ongoing legal troubles between the doctor and the former mayor and her whole family. Yumal has accused Furigai of corruption in the past and presumably still does so. But where did this conflict start? Now, the following is a quote from Rappler who have looked into this feud. Quote, Until 2019, physician Chao Tiao Yumol rubbed elbows with the Furigais and even visited the former mayor occasionally at her city hall office. Their relationship turned sour after the then mayor Furigai had Dr. Yumol's infirmary closed down on orders from the then health minister Safrula Dipatuan of the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao or BARMM. End of quote. So, the Ministry of Health in that region issued Dr. Yumol a cease and desist order for operating a clinic without license. The clinic was located in Barangay Maligaya in Lamitan, Basilan. It was the local government who was requested to actually go and shut down the clinic. The request came directly from Minister Dipatuan. It has to be noted, however, that the ministry headed by Dipatuan gave Yumol a month to apply for a license in order to avoid a shutdown, but Dr. Yumol did not actually this and so the shutdown was finalized. When the clinic was eventually closed, Yumol made an enemy out of Furigai and her husband, who was then serving as a vice mayor. 
Now, since then, Yumal had ceaselessly accused the couple of corruption and being involved in the local illegal drug trade, something that the Fori guys, of course, denied and still denies. It has to be noted that the accusations had become so severe and so serious that several government agencies made a joint resolution in late 2020 that served to clear the Fori guys from any accusations that they were involved in the illegal drug trade. Of course, this did not sit right with Yumal, who in his social media posts proceeded to also target Basilan Governor Jim Hataman Saliman for simply signing the resolution, essentially putting his stamp of approval on it. Yumol did not limit himself to those three people, though. He had targeted other politicians and even city hall employees. As a response, they had filed several cyber libel cases from 2019 onwards. One case even got so far that Yumol ended up being arrested, something that he was rather proud of. All in all, there are supposedly 76 cyber libel cases against Yumol. Now, in connection to all this, the netizens who were in support support of Yumol started a change.org petition to help him whilst he was in prison. This petition resurfaced in 2022 after the Ateneo shooting and somehow also gained a couple more signatures. Now, after the arrest, Yumo was actually allowed to say a few words on camera to some members of the media who were waiting for him, presumably at Camp Caringal. The video of Yumol making a statement is of low quality and I could only make a few things out like how he accused the Fori guys of ambushing him three times. He encouraged those interviewing him to check his social media accounts so they can see something he had mentioned that I could not quite make out from the audio. It would seem that the general gist of this interview was that he was trying to justify his killing of three people by saying that the Furi guys had treated him badly in the past. So that sums up the events of the 24th of July. There's nothing really to report from the 25th, so we can jump over to the 26th of July. On this day, Yumo's Facebook account lost its blue check verification. We also learned that the gun used for the shooting belonged to an active soldier. Also on this day, complaints for three counts of murder and one count of frustrated murder were filed. Furthermore, complaints for the violation of the Anti-Car Napping Act and malicious mischief were also filed. And this brings us to the 27th of July. On this day, Facebook took down Numo's page and that page had become inaccessible to the public, to his followers. However, even before it became inaccessible, he actually gained some more followers because, as I said, there had been a lot of support for him online. Staying on the subject of social media, I found it very interesting what Rappler did on this day because they analyzed social media postings on Facebook and YouTube about the Ateneo de Manila shooting. And they found that 56.6% of Facebook posts and 45.4% of YouTube videos from the day of the shooting until the 26th of July expressed support and sympathy for Yumol. They also further analyzed what those posts were saying in general. So the posts expressed that his actions were justified because of the supposed political injustices um, he had experienced. Uh, the posts also sought to humanize him by citing his medical work because he was a doctor. The posts also declared him a hero for exposing corruption and rampant illegal drug trade in Lamitan. With this analysis, they also interviewed a communications expert by the name of Fatima Go or Gao, G-A-W, who I think works for UP, the University of the Philippines. And there's one quote that I want to really read out to you uh, because she was worried about this, you know, online behavior. She found it troubling and she said the following. Quote, in many ways, it is part of a reactionary digital culture that makes a spectacle out of other people's experiences, which in this case is tragic and irreversible. What is troubling is that people are making these statements on unfounded grounds and these conversations are being capitalized by political actors to either control the damage or spin the story to their advantage. End of quote. 
Sort of along the same lines of that post from Maharlika, Yuma was also being portrayed in other posts as being a whistleblower who just wanted to free Lamitan from illegal drugs and he was also being hailed as a patriot. Also in this day, people would find out about posts about Yuma, um, who referenced his beef with former Presidential Anti-Corruption Commission Chairman Greco Belhica. And if you don't know, Yumol filed a complaint against Belhica back in the day, essentially accusing him of not addressing his accusations and complaints about the Forigai's uh, supposed involvement in the illegal drug trade. Now, this complaint was dismissed by the PACC um, because they do not actually have jurisdiction over elected officials. So that really sums up the 27th of July and we are now going to go into the 28th of July. On the 28th of July, police found probable cause to charge Yumol. The Quezon City Prosecutor's Office indicted Dr. Chao Tiao Yumol, who is facing three counts of murder, one count of frustrated murder, car theft, malicious mischief, and violation of Republic Act Number no. 10591, or the Comprehensive Law on Firearms and Ammunition. BNP Directorate of Operations Head Major General Valeriano de Leon told reporters that Yumal had some revelations that the investigators were exploring, but unfortunately de Leon would not give any details as to what these revelations were. On this day, Meta, formerly known as Facebook, confirmed that Yumal's Facebook and Instagram accounts had been taken down for violating their dangerous individuals and organizations policy. Meanwhile, YouTube had also taken down Yumal's channel for violating their violent criminal organizations policy. It was, however, felt by a lot of Filipinos that taking down Yumal's accounts or channel meant little when posts about him or posts supporting him were or are still very much out there and being shared quite rampantly. Fatima Go, who also shared her thoughts on this, said, quote, I would argue that the individual right to free expression should be protected, but there should be higher standards for influential users who have the capacity to shape discourse and potentially inspire others to do socially problematic, if not criminal, acts. But because influencers share a mutually beneficial relationship with platforms, they may not act on it until grave social harm has been done. End of quote. Now, a great example for what she just said here was the kind of social media mobilization that happened just before the January 6th insurrection at the Capitol in the United States. Now, moving forward to the 29th of July, it was a rather sad day. News broke out that Yumal's father was shot dead outside of his residence in Lamitan City, Basilan. Of course, all eyes were on the Forigais, but they denied involvement. It can be presumed that the police in that region are investigating what happened to Yumal's father, but so far there's not much information out there about the case. It was also on the 29th of July that Rappler released a video, a kind of homage to Genevieve Bandiala, who in the first few days after the shooting was merely called the security guard who died alongside Rose Forigai and Victor George Capistrano. Genevin Bandiala, it would seem, led a good life, and it is a sad thing that he had to die during this shooting. If you can find this video on the Rappler website or on their Twitter feed, please, please watch it. This now brings us to the 30th of July. The Quezon City Police said that on this day, Yumal was brought to a facility in Payatas following a commitment order for his transfer. A commitment order is a written order issued by the court or any other agencies authorized by law to entrusting an inmate to a prison for safekeeping during pendency of his, her, or their case. That's all that happened on the 30th, so let's proceed with the 31st of July. On this day, the remains of Rose Forigai were flown back to Basilan. Her widower, Wadrick Forigai, also made an appeal on this day for justice for the Yumal family over the killing of Yumal's father. It was also on this day that the daughter of Rose Forigai, Kelsey Forigai, said that she had been receiving death threats from trolls and Yumal sympathizers. 
we would also learn that had the shooting not taken place, both Yu Mol and Rose Forigai were supposed to appear in court that week on a slew of cyber libel cases that the Forigais filed against him after he wrote several malicious insinuations against them on social media. After this day, it was quiet, so we did not learn anything about this case on the 1st and 2nd of August. It was only on the 3rd of August that we would hear something new about the case. So the 3rd of August, on this day, Yumal pleaded not guilty to charges of malicious mischief and illegal possession of a firearm. But actually, he pleaded the day before. It was only reported the day after. I don't think there was ever any plea put in or entered for the other charges of murder and frustrated murder. At least nothing that I've found. On the 3rd of August, we also learn that Rose Furigai's funeral was made public. So it was made accessible and people in Lamitan were able to mourn her and um, see her before she uh, was buried. And talking of burial, uh, she was laid to rest that day at noon on her family's property in the village of Limuok after a necrological mass at the St. Peter the Apostle Church in Lamitan. And that's really it for the 3rd of August. Um <clears throat> For the 4th of August, we would learn that the Quezon City Regional Trial Court Branch 98 had reset the arraignment for Yumol. It was done upon the request of his lawyers who wanted Yumol to undergo a medical examination saying that he was exhibiting symptoms of insanity. So he was then scheduled to undergo a mental health test as well. Now the Fori guys, of course, they commented on it and said that uh, lawyers for you all were trying to set the stage for an insanity defense. And I guess this would also hint as to what will happen um, if ever a trial would take place. Um, there's no news about the results of this test and I'll, about a lot of things really that are still pending. And there's nothing really after the 4th of August. As soon as there's more out there about this case, I will let you know either on Instagram, through my stories, or through a post on Lagim's account. Um, or I'll make a video short on YouTube. Um, but I think it'll take some time before we will know more about what's going on in this case and whether a trial is imminent or whether we'll have to wait a year or two like in other cases before a trial actually takes place which is lamentable but it's a reality of the Filipino criminal justice system unfortunately. Um, keep following me on all my social media accounts and don't forget to check out my podcast. Um, I've got three seasons that you can listen to, so quite a back catalog there. So if you're bored, listen to it, support the podcast, subscribe, like, comment, whatever. Um, I'm also on Twitter, on TikTok, Facebook, like I said, Instagram, and on YouTube. Um, and if you have any questions, leave them in the comments, send me a DM, and I'll try my best to answer. Thank you so much for watching, and goodbye.